Lights out. All right. Welcome, everyone, to a functioning episode of Sleep Tech Talk, the sleep podcast with your hosts and friends, Robert Miller, Emerson Kerr, and me, Dr. Jerry George Moneycrow. And yes, we are functioning in full capacity with, once again, another fantastic guest. And tell you a little bit more about that fantastic and fabulous guest. Robert, over to you, sir. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Jerry. And uh, welcome, everyone, to the show. Um, we have with us today Drew Copeland, um, Sleep Tech, um, who has uh, incredible experience, uh, has worked at some you know, pretty prestigious um, sleep programs and um, has become an entrepreneur of sorts with uh, multiple companies and, and uh, different things that he's working on today. I think it's, uh, it, I've also seen Drew involved in some webinars recently uh, with uh, some of the, the manufacturers out there that are uh, uh, producing different products that we all use in our sleep center operations. Uh, but Drew, we, uh, we welcome you to the show and we just um, thank you for participating and, and we appreciate what you do for, you know, to advance sleep medicine in our industry. Um, but tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into sleep. That's how we sort of start these things off. And, um, and then we'll, we'll sort of move into, uh, you know, what you're, what you're up to today. Sure. No, just want to thank you guys first for having me on. This is really, really exciting. Uh, I wish I had the same background as you guys. I feel a little left out, but, um, uh, so yeah, I, you know, started sleep the way that, uh, probably most people did. I was a music major in college. Um, Wait, no, that's, uh, that was a music major. I uh, did that for a couple of years. Um, then I took the next natural step and I dropped out and I became a construction worker, you know, very typical journey. Um, but uh, uh, I eventually actually stumbled into sleep. I, I was working construction. I was about a block away from a hospital. I was tired of, you know, carrying drywall and, you know, running around on roofs all the time. So I walked into the hospital and I asked if they were hiring. They were hiring a clerk in the sleep lab. And I was like, yeah, sure, cool. What's a sleep lab? Sounds great. Um, and that's where I got my start. So started off, uh, you know, scheduling patients and, you know, uh, you know, making sure that the cancellations uh, slots were filled and, you know, faxing the results out. Um, while I was there, I, um, when I saw what was going on, I said, hey, uh, I talked to the clinical coordinator. I said, would you train me? And he said, no. I said no, you're 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 a great sleep, you're a great clerk. Like our 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 like uh, utilization rate is like ninety eight percent because of you. No way, I, I want you in that role. So, um, I kept pestering, kept pestering him, and so eventually, I actually think I have. Yep, I have him here. Um, he handed me the atlas of polysomnography. These two, the two big tomes, and I think he was trying to deter me. He said, "All right, so read these, and you know, after that, then we'll talk about it." So I didn't tell him, I but I read them. And um, I was actually sitting there taking minutes at a tech meeting and the medical director uh, said to all the techs, he had like a thing on this on the screen and he was like, so can anyone tell me what this is? And, you know, no one said anything. And I went, isn't that alpha intrusion? And he was like, yes. And uh, the, I will never forget the clinical coordinator like looks at me and goes, okay, fine, I'll train you. So that's how I got started in sleep. I, I was, uh, started off as an EEG tech, did that for a bit. As I was doing that, I was cross-trained as a sleep tech. Uh, did a couple days as an EEG tech, a couple nights as an as a overnight tech. Um, and I just loved it. Uh, you know, the combination, uh, you know, when I, was in, when I was a music major, I loved kind of the combination of the art of music, but I was also a music theory geek. So I loved like matching the art with the science. And that's how I've always felt sleep was, you know, I loved really knowing everything about sleep, but like, I mean, anyone who's done like a really complicated CPAP titration, like it's almost, it is an art form to really do that. So I loved that worked on, so I ended up working nights for 10 years uh, as an overnight uh, tech. I, you know, did the lead tech thing, did all that. Um, I moved to New York, became a daytime scoring tech. Uh, did that for a while. Um, you know, then went back, we was a pediatric sleep tech for a bit. I was an overnight supervisor. Then I, uh, kind of honestly lucked into a position at Mount Sinai. Um, I saw David Rappaport speak at a conference and, um, speaking about phenotypes. And it was the first time I had heard that. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. This is what we should be doing. So I emailed him afterwards. I said, you know, Hey, I loved everything you said. I would love the opportunity to work with you. Um, and I actually, this is great. I, I got an email not back from him, but back from Dr. Omar Burstyn, who became my, he, we were, he calls us Batman and Batman when we were at Mount Sunny. It wasn't Batman and Robin, it was Batman and Batman. Um, but uh, he emailed back and all on the subject line, it just said, hi, I am, I am Omar Burstyn, call me with his cell phone number. So I uh, called him back 
and got a, a job at Mount Sinai. I was the director of the sleep lab and then was promoted to the director of operations for the sleep program. Um, was doing that until about six months ago. And then I left academic medicine and now I'm doing about 14 different things all at the same time. So is, is that what you were looking for? Does that sound good? Yeah, no, that's, that's perfect. Uh, it's, it's funny. I think that we're going to have to end up putting a sleep band back together because we had Dan Harold on the show a few, um, uh, a few episodes back. And I think that he started in music as well and, and uh -huh. worked his way into, uh, uh, into sleep, but I, it's hard to believe that you were working in a construction crew and you just happened to, to mosey into a hospital and they, <laughs> And, and the next thing you know, you're working in a sleep lab. That's that's a pretty incredible start to uh, to your sleep career. Yeah. Hey, real quick, real quick, I, I have to ask this. So, <laughs> you were a clerk in the morning, scheduling patients. So, when you went to do night nights, were you ever called off because there were no patients? So by the time I did that, so I worked as a clerk and then I transitioned to, to two days, like Mondays and Tuesdays, I was doing EEGs and then like Thursdays and Friday nights, I was overnight. So no, um, it's been a while since I have had that role that too, where I was scheduling my own patients during the day and then running the studies at night, you know, back in my, uh, my early twenties when I could actually do that, you know, before I was actually practicing what I preach and, you know, taking care of my sleep. But yeah, I've definitely been in that position as well. Um, awesome. Well, I, I know that you have pursued and you, you've obtained your CCSH. Um, tell us a little bit about that. What, what made you sort of pursue that and, and um, what was your intended use and then maybe how you've been able to take that and, and, and utilize it in your current role? Sure. Um, so I'm going to be really honest. When I first got my CCSH, just because I wanted a couple more letters at the end of my name, I thought it looked cool. Uh, that's um, that's total honesty there. Um, and in fact, I remember after I went for the test and I, I passed the test, uh, I sat down with uh, one of the guys I was working with at the time, a guy, Claude Albertario, he's been around forever. Um, and he was like, all right, so you're CCSH now, right? And I said, yeah. He said, so what can you do that I can't? And I was like, oh, I knew you were going to say that. Uh, and so... The answer is, um, I've actually, I used this in a call recently, um, how I view the CSH is if you are an RPSGT or an RSD or, or an RRT, that kind of, that proves that you know the information. Uh, CCSH is the, the paper, piece of paper that says you know how to teach the, the, the information, and that's how I view it. Um, it's especially uh, important in the, uh, the sleep coaching realm that I've been delving into recently, um, mostly because uh, I love the term sleep coach in a vacuum. I think it just really does encapsulate like a, a really key and essential um, uh, 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 role for, for patients who have a sleep issue. Problem is it's been misused uh, by well-intentioned, I would say in most cases, but, um, uh, uh, but you know, under experienced and educated people, you know, you got the people online who read a, a blog or, you know, they see a video and suddenly they just become a sleep coach. And so they're gonna sell you melatonin and a nice pillow and, you know, um, so I, I, when, when I think of the sleep coach, I really think of it in tandem with the CCSH. Um, you know, when uh, last year, actually, uh, the, uh, they had the, the, for the inaugural uh, CCSH Innovation Conference in, in, in Nashville, um, I was able to attend that. And I, I loved it. I love getting all the CCSHs together because in some cases, there were a lot of us in the room that were like, all right, we have this. We've had this for years, but what do we really do with it? And, and it was nice to get everyone together to really start ideating on that and figuring that out. Um, I will say that in my, uh, if I were to tell you what the CCSH is and should be, it really does fall into three categories. It's, it's uh, uh, someone that can educate the patient everything from on the disease state itself to what the journey is going to be for them for their different therapy options so they can make uh, informed decisions. It's someone who can help coordinate that care because I'm not sure if you know, the, uh, the sleep uh, journey is a little bit uh, fractured, a little bit uh, disjointed for most patients. Um, so yeah, tiny bit. So uh, the, the, to be their guide as they try to navigate that labyrinth. Um, and then finally, the thing that I'm really super excited about is the, the therapy monitoring at the end of this. Um, you know, just because of a number of reasons, mostly insurance driven, because, uh, you know, the all the money comes from diagnosing. 
And so that's where all the effort has been. But now with some of the, uh, the new initiatives that are out there, either the, these, uh, these remote patient monitoring codes that are available and, and are dr like drastically underutilized. And also with the, the uh, ever slowly, but ever changing, uh, uh, changing over from fee-for-service healthcare over to value-based, risk-based, where I, I really do think that we can shift this focus from saying, all right, there's a problem, all right, there's a problem, you know, to actually saying, all right, here, yes, we, we know there's a problem. Let's fix it. Let's figure out how we can get the patient to therapy. Let's do every intervention to get them compliant with that therapy. And if they're not going to be compliant with that therapy, get them to a different therapy or use adjunct therapies or combined therapies. I mean, that's where we really need to move to. So I'm excited about that. Uh, and I think that CCSH plays a super, super key role in that. I wish you were a lot more enthusiastic, Drew, because it's really <laughs> coming through. Um, no, this is really a lot of fun. You know, to your point, since about 2019, we've seen this surge with, you know, health coaching, with uh, RPM, and all of these things. <clears throat> One of the things we often hear a lot of questions about is, you know, how does someone really incorporate this into what they do, particularly around billing, and how do you yeah. pay for it? And that's that seems to be a sticking point in some places, and it's, sure. it can be a significant hurdle, particularly from a political standpoint. Sure. How would you navigate those headwinds? Because they can be they can really trip a program up. Yeah. So I, um, I luckily was able to, for the years I was at Mount Sinai and a little bit before put on the, uh, the, the cap of the healthcare administrator. So I'm able to look at this from that perspective as well. Um, when you talk about how to pay for this, uh, there's what we just mentioned, these rural patient monitoring codes. And for, for just for any listeners who don't know, there are discrete billable CPT codes that can be used um, to interact with the patient to make interventions and help them through their therapy. Uh, there are some rules that go around them, but it, there, it's not that hard to figure out and, and implement. Um, and and uh, as I said previously, it's vastly underutilized. That's the quickest and easiest way to use a CCSH in that role. You, you are the clinical staff operating under the general supervision of the billing provider, and that's a great way to do it. But that's really just one line in the column. It's the simplest one. The other piece of this is, is all the downstream effects and the, the, the soft money that you have here. You know, uh, it, There's a big push in all of healthcare to use physician extenders, including in sleep. To be honest, I think that in sleep medicine, the, the CCSH can perform really the same role that most of the PAs and NPs are performing. Um, there's no reason that the, uh, Catherine Hansen actually has an amazing uh, presentation on how to use the CCSH and really talks to the quality measures that you can, uh, 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 you know, as long as you're capturing that data, you can quantify and, and present that. But um, what I will tell you is, uh, as a as a polysomnographic technologist, my job was to acquire data, usually PSG data, was to analyze that data, that's when I was scoring, and then present that to the physician. If you're going to be operating in the clinical world as a CCSH, you're doing the same thing, you're just changing the data. There's literally no reason why the data I capture as a CCSH can't be the patient's medical history and their um, their their medication. There's no reason. It's it's a form. I mean, the patient can fill out themselves. Obviously, I can ask them those questions, especially with a little bit of training. So I can capture that data. I can even analyze some of that data. I can say, all right, so looking at this, there's a pretty high likelihood. I'm not going to make the clinical decisions. I'm not going to order the sleep study. I'm not going to uh, prescribe medication. But why not take exactly what we do with a PSG of acquiring and analyzing and pack packaging it up for the physician and do the same thing in the clinical practice for the sleep physician? So that's that's. I think uh, it's a software. way. It means the physician can be more productive. It means maybe they can see more new patients and, and, and some of the follow-up work can be done by the CCSH. And honestly, there's, there's a lot of the, the stuff that the physicians do that I would love to take off their plate. I don't want a physician to honestly ever, no offense, Robert, I don't want a physician to do much with a DME company at all. I want I want a, a, a sleep tech to, to do most of that work. We, we, we can, and just get their, get their uh, signature when needed. Yeah. Hey, no, no offense taken, because I, I think that, you know, the, the, the RPM that a physician can do out of their practice in tandem with what the DME company is, is doing is exactly how we're yes. able to um, get patients to a, to a point of adherence. And actually, yes. I made a recommendation to a, to a couple of the BRPT board members uh, a couple of years ago that I felt like that 
you know, at some point that we need to work on trying to uh, get uh, to, to make it so that there are mandates that adherence monitoring has to be done by credential professionals um, and not necessarily just a, an on the job trained, um, you know, um, customer service rep, if you would. So I love that. That, that hadn't happened yet, but uh, it's something, you know, just as respiratory therapists and, and societies have um, sort of jockeyed to make sure that there is legislation to protect their mm -hmm. individual sort of uh, profession, you know, this certainly feels like a, a something that sleep should be doing, you know, to protect, you know, the, the sleep tech and, and provide other opportunities for sleep tech, sure. you know, from a, a patient monitoring standpoint. Yeah, I was just going to say this is no different from a work a workup by a nurse in in a clinical setting. They yep. go there, they review the charts, they prepare it, and they hand it off to the physician right. for their physician's recommendations and or uh, signature. And it's it's no different from that. I I, I thought it was yep. a, brilliant, a brilliant thought what you're bringing out right here. Yeah, the an important thing about that I will say an important nuance is. I, and I said this to Catherine, I, said, I would like, I want to elevate the CCSH credential and I want to elevate it honestly to the point where I don't qualify. You know, I mentioned at the very beginning of this, I, I, I am a college rep. I don't, I never went back and got my bachelor's degree. I would like for the CCSH to require that. I would like to make sure that the CCSH if we're going to expand the scope of practice, we have to make sure that that the that the competencies are there. Um, and in my perfect ideal utopian world here, a CCSH is someone that can provide cognitive behavioral therapy independently, as long as they have the proper training. Uh, the provocateur thing I actually tweeted the a couple of weeks ago was at 2 a.m. when I'm running a, a CPAP titration. I can look at the patient, see apnea, and increase their pressure to two centimeters. A month later, when they're at home, I've got to get a physician's order to do the exact same thing. And I don't understand that logic. It doesn't make any sense to me. So why not have a CCSH who you know is, is going to be able to make, you know, very like low risk clinical judgments, but still clinical judgments, give them the authority to make those. You know, there's no reason why a CCSA shouldn't be able to look at a patient with a fixed CPAP of 10, whose AHI is 12, and increase the pressure by two centimeters without having a physician sign off on that. It, it boggles my mind, honestly. Drew, uh, you, you've hit some really, really good points here, and it's been uh, a joy to have you on the, on the show uh, we really appreciate it. Like, like Emerson said, we couldn't tell if you're enthusiastic or not. <laughs> yeah. Um, those of you listening on, on the podcast, you should check out the, check out the, the YouTube channel because you're going to get to see uh, Drew and Acton. but uh, Drew, we're running out of time. Any, uh, anything else that you really want to touch, touch on very quickly before we close? Yeah, very, very quick. Um, I, I'm doing a lot in, uh, I've, as I said, I got a lot going on. I'm, I'm running a home sleep testing uh, uh, business now. I'm doing sleep coaching. I'm moving into the remote patient monitoring space. That said, um, for all of the sleep techs out there, if you are scoring sleep studies, if you are running sleep studies, I I'm not saying that, that you have to do something else. You are foundational. You are doing the work and these that is needed. Patients need that. If you love it and you do it, wonderful. Please keep doing it. I applaud you and I thank you. For those of you who want something not better, but different, know that there are different options for you, especially as, as the, the, the culture, the, the whole world of sleep changes. There's going to be stuff for you if you want to be out there. I'm kind of living proof that there is. So. Drew, we need to finish that up with amen, right? I know, no. exactly. Can I get an amen? That's right. Amen. <laughs> but, uh, we, we thank you so much for, our, for putting that out there. And I, I think that's kind of the direction that our show is going. And we sincerely appreciate you bringing that up because there is value in those that are running studies and those that are scoring the studies. We, that's the foundation of, of all that we do here. But we, we just want to tell all those listeners out there, all our viewers, thank you so much. We sincerely appreciate the support. Keep giving us the likes. Keep giving, uh, uh, downloading the, the show on all your podcast pl platforms. Please don't forget to comment, to send out reviews, and also especially share it with your friends uh, all out there. There are thousands and thousands of sleep techs out there and uh, even more sleep professionals. Please share it with everybody. And until next time, we want to say thank you and lights on.